Great. Well, um, welcome to the colloquium of Warwick's Department of Philosophy. It's great to take a pause in the middle of our academic week um, to share a talk and philosophy and conversation together. It's great to have you with us. Uh, the, today's colloquium is going to unfold as follows. Shortly, we're going to invite our guest speaker for today, Professor Bob Brandom, to present his paper. Uh, we'll then take a short five minute pause um, to regather our thoughts and then we'll spend the remainder of the time in questions and conversations. Uh, and our aim will be to finish by 5.45. Um, and that is 1.45 Pittsburgh time. Uh, so to begin, uh, allow me to present today's speaker. Uh, Bob Brandom is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh. He's received several of the highest honors in the field, including fellowships at the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences, uh, and closer to home, also at the British Academy. Uh, he delivered the John Locke lectures at Oxford in 2006, which was published as Between Saying and Doing Towards an Analytic Pragmatism. Uh, Professor Brandom has I think offered an enormous service to the field by drawing productive connections between the history of modern philosophy, particularly Kant and Hegel, uh, into conversation with some of the most pressing questions in contemporary analytic philosophy, especially in semantics, pragmatic metaphysics and philosophy of action. Among his many books and articles, uh, Bob is author of Making It Explicit, Tales of the Mighty Dead, and most recently, A Spirit of Trust, a reading of Hegel's phenomenology. Today, Bob will be presenting a paper entitled The Fine Structure of Autonomy and Recognition, the Institution of Normative Statuses by Normative Attitudes. So again, I'll repost uh, Bob's handout in the chat box, which you can find by clicking on the chat um, uh, icon below uh, my face. Um, so Bob, we'd like to thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Uh, we're delighted that you're with us today and we invite you now to present your paper. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, in honor of uh, talking in Warwick and uh, as a measure of the respect I have for the department, what you're gonna get today is the hardcore stuff. Uh, my central focus in this talk is Hegel's idea that norms are instituted by reciprocal recognition. But I'm gonna start with Kant's precursor understanding of norms in terms of autonomy. The aim is to develop a regimented idiom and model to explore the development in normative pragmatics that takes us from Kant to Hegel. At its base is the distinction between normative statuses and normative attitudes. In the idiom of the regimentation I'll offer, this distinction corresponds to Hegel's distinction between what consciousness is in itself and what consciousness is for consciousness. Hegel also distinguishes within the domain of what consciousness is for consciousness between what a consciousness is for another consciousness and what a consciousness is for itself. This distinction is rendered in my model by distinguishing two sorts of normative attitudes in terms of the different social perspectives they embody, attributing a normative status to another and acknowledging or claiming a normative status oneself. This additional distinction within the category of normative attitudes is matched in the model by a distinction within the category of normative statuses. That's the distinction between authority and responsibility. It corresponds, according to the interpretation being presented here, to Hegel's use of the terms independence and dependence of hanging kite, when they're applied to subjects of consciousness rather than the objects of consciousness. The picture, the structure that's envisaged is accordingly uh, the one I'm displaying. Here, the elements of the model, the idiom I'm going to use, uh, are in bold, and the Hegelian phrases uh, that are being modeled uh, are in quotes. And this should be on your handout uh, as well. So in the regimented idiom of the model, the paradigmatic normative statuses are identified as responsibility and authority, 
or commitment and entitlement. The attitudes in question include attributing these statuses to another and acknowledging them or claiming them oneself. I'm claiming that the vocabulary of this regimentation lines up well with and illuminates the vocabulary that Hegel himself uses. Though the concern of the self-consciousness chapter of the phenomenology is ultimately with the subjects of normative attitudes and statuses, those attitudes and statuses also have objects. On the side of attitudes, what's attributed or acknowledged is just statuses of authority and responsibility. One normative subject X can attribute authority or responsibility to another, Y. X is then the subject of the attitude, the normative status attributed is the object of the attitude, and the subject to whom these status is attributed is their in indirect object or target of the attribution. So for instance, in Hegel's terminology, one consciousness can be independent or dependent, not only in itself, but also for itself or for another consciousness. In the case of acknowledgments, the subject and the target are the same, not just de facto, but de jure, as part of what it means for the attitude in question to be acknowledgement. Normative statuses of authority and responsibility also have both subjects and objects. The subject of the status is the normative subject who is authoritative or responsible. The objects are what they have authority over or responsibility for. One of my central concerns here is with the fundamental case where what one has the authority or responsibility to do, what one is entitled or committed to do, is to adopt normative attitudes of attributing or acknowledging further normative statuses. The fact that the objects of normative attitudes can be normative statuses and the objects of normative statuses can be normative attitudes means that complex constellations of basic attitudes and statuses are possible. And it's in these terms that I'll suggest we can understand both the Kantian individualistic autonomy model of the institution of normative statuses by normative attitudes and the Hegelian social recognition model of the institution of normative statuses by normative attitudes and the way in which the latter develops elaborate and elaborates the former that is the sort of aufhebung that it is if we start with the two basic normative statuses normative independence and dependence understood as authority and responsibility and the two basic normative attitudes attributing responsibility or authority to another and acknowledging or claiming responsibility or authority for oneself and think about them in the context of what is for Hegel the essentially modern idea that normative statuses are not just dependent on normative attitudes but are in some sense instituted by them then an important compound of statuses and attitudes becomes visible. Kant's construal of normativity in terms of autonomy is at base the idea that rational beings can make themselves responsible, can institute a normative status by taking themselves to be responsible, that is, by adopting an attitude. His idea, developing one of Rousseau's, is that so long as the attribution of responsibility is self-consciously self-directed, that is, so long as it takes the form of acknowledgement of oneself as responsible, it's constitutive in the sense that adopting that attitude is sufficient all by itself to institute the status. For Kant turned Rousseau's definition of freedom as constraint by a law one has laid down for oneself into a way to distinguish genuinely normative constraints from merely causal or matter of factual ones. What is it for an attitude of claiming or acknowledging responsibility to be constitutive of the status of responsibility it claims or acknowledges? For it immediately, that is all by itself apart from any other attitudes to institute that status. As the object of an attitude, as what is acknowledged or attributed, a normative status such as responsibility or authority as a kind of virtual existence. There need not in general be an actual status corresponding to the attitude. One subject might wrongly attribute a responsibility to another, 
or claim an authority she herself does not in fact possess. Kant's concept of normative subjects as autonomous, as I'm reading it, is a conception of them as able to bind themselves normatively by their attitudes, to make themselves responsible, acquire an actual normative status by taking themselves to be responsible, that is by adopting a normative attitude. In the favored cases, adopting the attitude actualizes the virtual status that's the object of the attitude. The resulting status is not just attitude dependent in the sense that no attitude implies no status, but is immediately instituted by the attitudes. Having the attitude implies having the status. That is what it is to understand the attitude as constitutive. Further, being able to adopt such immediately constitutive self-attributions is itself a normative status. For Kant thinks that rational knowers and agents have the authority to adopt immediately constitutive self-attributions or acknowledgments. To be a discursive being is, for Kant, to have the authority to commit oneself, epistemically in judgment and practically in intention, what he calls adopting a practical maxim. That special kind of normative authority is what autonomy consists in. Both of these the theoretical and the practical, are undertakings or acknowledgings of responsibility, committing oneself to how things are or how they shall be. This authority to make oneself responsible just by taking oneself to be responsible, autonomy, might be called the basic Kantian normative status, BKNS for short. Being a normative subject for Kant is being an autonomous agent and knower, one who's the subject of normative statuses such as responsibility and authority. And furthermore, one is in the end, in the primary sense, committed to or responsible for only what one explicitly acknowledges as one's commitments and entitlements, uh, one's commitments and responsibilities. And in a secondary sense, for commitments that turn out to be implicit in those acknowledgments as consequences or presuppositions of them. It's that authority to make oneself responsible that, according to Kant, other rational beings are obliged to recognize as the fundamental dignity of rational knowers and agents. The basic Kantian normative status, autonomy, is accordingly a complex attitude involving status. For it is the authority, a complex status, to adopt a certain kind of attitude, an immediately status instituting attitude, what I'm calling an immediately constitutive attitude. This sort of attitude is an attributing of a status, in the case of the BKNS, exclusively to oneself, such that adoption of that attitude is sufficient all by itself for the status actually or genuinely to be exhibited by the one to whom it's attributed. In Hegel's terminology, it's a way consciousness can be for a consciousness that's sufficient to determine that that is the way the consciousness is in itself. For one's consciousness to be that way, for one's own consciousness, is to be that way in itself. Here's the basic Kantian normative status. You have the authority to bind yourself by norms, to make yourself responsible by acknowledging a responsibility. Here, as in subsequent diagrams, normative statuses are recognized by polygons of different kinds and normative attitudes by ovals, ultimately of different orientations. The bulk of the self-consciousness chapter of the phenomenology consists of an investigation of the conception of this kind of immediately status constituting attitude. For the idea of individual attitudes of attributing statuses that suffice all by themselves, just in virtue of being the kind of attitude they are, to institute the statuses they attribute, is the idea Hegel allegorizes under the heading of mastery or pure independence. What that 
is purified of is all hint of dependence. That is, the idea of mastery is the idea of authority without correlative responsibility. And that's the, that notion of pure independence, authority without responsibility, is the topic of all the allegories of kinds of self-consciousness that are recounted in the self-consciousness chapter. The concept of immediately status constitutive attitudes is an extreme version of what Hegel thinks of as the basic idea of modernity. On this rendering of the transition from traditional to modern, traditional forms of life revolved around an appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes, what we can now recharacterize as the authority of norms over attitudes, of how what obligations and authorities there are determine what responsibilities and authority normative subjects should acknowledge and attribute. By contrast, modern forms of life are characterized by an appreciation of the attitude dependence of normative statuses. What we can now recharacterize is the authority of attitudes over norms. The way in which what obligations and authorities there are and what they are answers to the attributions and acknowledgements of normative subjects. The idea that some attitudes can immediately institute the normative statuses that are their objects, that in their case, taking someone to be authoritative or responsible can by itself make them have that authority or responsibility, is on Hegel's view, a characteristic deformation of the modern insight into the attitude dependence of normative statuses. It's the idea allegorized as mastery. Hegel sees modernity as shot through with this conception of the relations between normative attitudes and normative statuses. And it's precisely this aspect of modernity that he thinks eventually needs to be overcome. In the end, he thinks even Kant's symmetric, reflexive, self-directed version of the idea in the form of the autonomy model of normativity is a form of mastery. In Hegel's rationally reconstructed recollection of the tradition, which identifies and highlights an expressively progressive trajectory through it, Kant's is the final, most enlightened modern form, the one that shows the way forward. But it is nonetheless a form of the structural misunderstanding of normativity in terms of mastery, an ideal of pure independence, which modernity fails to overcome. To claim that normative attitudes institute normative statuses goes beyond the mere claim of attitude dependence of normative statuses. But the claim that at least some normative attitudes are immediately constitutive of normative statuses goes beyond even this second claim. Such a way of taking someone to be committed must be sufficient for making one be committed. Self-consciousness that understands itself in terms of the categories of mastery construes normativity generally in terms of immediately status constitutive attitudes. Hegel clearly thinks that such a conception takes the insight of modernity concerning the attitude dependence of normative statuses too far. The form of his objection to all forms of self-conception that have the characteristic shape of mastery is the same. We can think of Hegel's diagnosis of the metaphysical error that manifests itself as forms of self-consciousness understanding itself in the way characteristic of mastery as having three levels proceeding from the more to the less abstract. First, it's characteristic of self-consciousness with the structure of mastery to understand itself as being in itself pure independence. That is, it conceives itself as exercising authority unmixed and unmediated by any correlative responsibility, which is normative dependence. This Hegel claims is an ultimately incoherent conception. It's something the master can be at most for himself, not in himself. And as so conceived, the master would be unable to, in the end, to commit himself. For a determinately contentful commitment, involves being responsible to the content to which one has committed oneself, in the sense that one makes oneself liable to assessment of one's success in fulfilling that commitment, 
a judgment's being true or an intention successful, according to the normative standard that's set by the content of one's status. In the end, the master cannot acknowledge even that moment of dependence as responsibility. Second, as what Hegel calls pure independence, mastery cannot acknowledge the responsibility of his attitudes to normative statuses, the status dependence of normative attitudes that was, Hegel thinks, a genuine insight of traditional forms of normativity, that is, Geist. Albeit one that was expressed in deformed because one-sided practical conceptions of normativity in terms of the model of subordination and obedience. The question of whether the normative status the master acknowledges or claims what he is for himself is what he really is in himself can't even arise within the conception of mastery. For to acknowledge facts about what someone is really committed or entitled to, what responsibility or authority they really have, what they are in themselves, is to acknowledge something that serves as normative standards for the evaluation of the correctness of normative attitudes of attributing, acknowledging, or claiming those statuses. By contrast, the master must understand his attitudes and their authority as answering to, responsible to, dependent on, nothing. Finally, the master has a conception of normative force in Frege's sense of the pragmatic significance of status and attitudes. What one is doing in becoming authoritative or responsible and in attributing and exercising authority or attributing and acknowledging responsibility, the master has a conception that leaves no room for the contrast and division of labor between such force and the determinate conceptual content of either normative statuses or attitudes. This, I will claim, is the form of complaint that binds together the treatment of all the forms of self-consciousness conceiving itself according to categories of mastery. There's no intelligible semantics, account of content, that's compatible with that pragmatics, that account of normative force, status, and attitude to which the masters are committed. A key to this line of thought is that Hegel understands the relation between Phrygian force and content between statuses and attitudes on the one hand and content on the other, in normative terms of authority and responsibility, that is independence and dependence. Developing a lesson he learned from Kant, Hegel takes the notion of content itself to be something that must be understood in terms of the way in which to understand statuses and attitudes as contentful is to understand them as responsible to, and so normatively dependent on, something determined by that content. Now Hegel thinks there's something deeply defective about the idea of normative attitudes that are immediately constitutive of normative statuses, which lies at the core of the Kantian understanding of normativity in terms of individual autonomy. Though there's also something deeply right about the Kant-Rousseau development of the self-government tradition in the modern metaphysics of normativity, the insight it affords about normative statuses as not only attitude dependent, but as ultimately instituted by attitudes. But somehow that must be reconciled with the insight that normative statuses are, for Hegel, at base, social statuses. Hegel's recognition model of the institution of normative statuses by normative attitudes articulates the idea that other regarding attitudes of attributing responsibility and authority, holding other normative subjects responsible, taking them to be authoritative, are equally essential to them really being responsible or authoritative, having the statuses of being committed or entitled, as are the self-regarding attitudes of acknowledging those statuses on which Kant's notion of autonomy focuses. The social dimension provided by normative attitudes of attribution that's at the core of Hegel's recognitive story is not simply absent from Kant's picture though. It's true that for Kant, having the authority to make oneself responsible, to institute that kind of normative status by adopting a purely self-regarding attitude of acknowledging the responsibility, that is having the authority to commit oneself, 
in constance owes nothing to its attribution by others that authority that autonomy that status that's constitutive of being a discursive being a subject of normative attitudes and statuses that basic constitutive normative status is not itself for kant instituted by normative attitudes in this respect Kant acknowledges not only the attitude dependence of ground level responsibilities, but also the dependence of the status instituting capacity of those attitudes on the normative status that is the authority to institute responsibilities by acknowledging them, the authority to commit oneself that is autonomy. But that status as an autonomous normative subject, the subject of commitments just insofar as one is able in the sense of having the authority to commit oneself, to bind oneself by norms that are binding just insofar as the one bound acknowledges them as binding, is also for Kant a constitutive kind of dignity. As such, he thinks it unconditionally deserves the respect of other autonomous normative subjects. They have a duty, an obligation, a responsibility to respect that dignity that consists in the authority to make oneself responsible by taking oneself to be responsible. So Kant's picture does have a social dimension in which attitudes of attribution, as well as those of acknowledgement, play a role. We could diagram it like this. This is a complex interpersonal constellation of basic normative attitudes and statuses in which relations of statuses as objects of attitudes and attitudes as objects of statuses are piled one and up on one another five levels deep. Starting at the top of the diagram, as rational beings, we have a standing formal obligation or responsibility, a status, going to call that level five, to respect in the sense of attributing, now attribution is an attitude, that's at level four, attributing to each rational being as a rational being, the dignity in the sense of having the authority, authority is a status, now at level three, which, which we attribute at level four, dignity in the sense of having authority constitutively to acknowledge, that's a status instituting attitude at level two, responsibilities or commitments, statuses now at ground level one, both doxastic in judgment and practical in intention. Now, all of these elements, Hegel can and does applaud. And they are the basis for him to say that Kant was almost right. He had all the crucial conceptual elements, just not arranged properly. So Kant has the idea that it's a necessary condition of being responsible that one acknowledges that responsibility. That's autonomy. And he does leave room for a distinction between explicitly acknowledging the responsibility and acknowledging it only implicitly. For instance, just by being a knower and an agent, thinking, talking, and acting intentionally. But one might think, I think Hegel does think, that this is not yet a full-blooded sense of being responsible. It might well be laid alongside of another important but not yet full-blooded sense of being responsible that consists simply in being held responsible, a matter of attribu attributing without acknowledging. Hegel claims the genuine responsibility requires both of those attitudes. In fact, arranged as reciprocal recognition, dual attitudes of acknowledging and attributing of the status. His view is what one gets by accepting the Kantian picture, but treating both attitudes, the attribution of authority in respecting it, as well as the dignity of its exercise in acknowledging responsibility, as necessary and jointly sufficient for the institution of normative statuses. Looking at the diagram of the complex constellation of basic attitudes and statuses that make up the basic Kantian normative status of autonomy, 
makes it clear that although the determinate responsibilities at the bottom of the diagram, cognitive commitments to claims and practical commitments to doings, but both of them are in, both those kinds of responsibility are instituted by immediately constitutive attitudes. The authority to do that, the authority to bind oneself, which is autonomy, is not conceived as itself instituted by attitudes. And looking at the diagram of the social extension of the basic Kantian normative status, likewise makes clear that the duty to respect the autonomy of others is also a status that for Kant is not itself instituted by attitudes. Being autonomous and having the responsibility to respect autonomy by attributing the authority to commit oneself are both statuses that are not instituted by attitudes, but are for Kant constitutive of the status of being a rational discursive being. That's why for him, a special story needs to be told a separate argument given, justifying treating them as two sides of one coin, treating autonomy and respect for the dignity of the autonomous as two necessarily entwined aspects of one conception of such being. Suppose someone accepted the motivations that lead Kant to the conception of the complex of basic attitudes and statuses it is the socially extended basic Kantian normative status of autonomy, but thought that all the normative statuses are instituted by normative attitudes. And that such institution requires not only the attitude of the subject of the status, but also the attitude of some other who attributes it. That there's no responsibility without someone to hold one responsible. This latter is the idea that the attitudes of any one individual normative subject can institute normative statuses only when they're suitably complemented by the attitudes of others. According to this line of thought, the respect that others owe to autonomous normative subjects is not something added to the authority those subjects have as autonomous, as autonomous to institute responsibilities by acknowledging them to make themselves responsible by taking themselves to be responsible. What Hegel calls recognition, the recognitive attitude of attributing the authority distinctive of autonomy, is for Hegel an essential component required to institute that very authority. These are the thoughts that lead from the Kantian model of individual autonomous normative subjects as immediately instituting their determinate responsibilities by their attitudes of acknowledging them, to the Hegelian social institution of normative statuses by attitudes of normative subjects that must be mediated by each other's suitably complementary recognitive attitudes. What results from modifying the socially extended complex of basic attitudes and statuses that comprises both autonomy and the duty to respect it is a complex of attitudes and statuses that has a different, symmetrical, essentially social structure. At the crudest level, its structure is this. This is a very basic constellation of normative attitudes and statuses. And I understand Hegel is taking this to be the underlying metaphysical structure of genuine normativity. All that's shown in this diagram is the complex constellation of attitudes and statuses exhibited by the two normative subjects that corresponds to the top two thirds of the diagram of the basic Kantian normative statuses. It doesn't represent the specific responsibilities and other statuses that each is recognized as having the authority to acknowledge. What is represented is a structure of general recognition, not special recognition. It represents recognition in the sense of recognizing as taking to be a general recognizer. That is a normative subject of statuses and attitudes. This is attributing the authority to adopt attitudes that are constitutive of statuses, not immediately, but in the mediated sense that they institute statuses if they're suitably socially complemented. 
in order to institute the authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes, here attributions, one must oneself be taken to have, to be recognized as having that authority by another, whom one in turn recognizes as having the very same authority. The idea is that recognitive attitudes can institute recognitive authority just in case those attitudes are suitably socially complemented in the sense of being reciprocated. Recognitive authority, the authority that corresponds to autonomy in the basic Kantian normative sta status, the authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes, is itself instituted by suitably complemented recognitive attitudes, by reciprocal recognition. It's only when those attitudes are suitably complemented that they genuinely have the authority to institute normative statuses. That is, Hegelian recognition is what Kantian respect for the authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes becomes when that attribution of authority by another is understood as essential to the institution of the very authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes. Put somewhat paradoxically, for Hegel, autonomy is an essentially social normative achievement. As autonomous, Kantian normative subjects can, in a certain sense, lift themselves up by their own bootstraps. For they can actualize normative statuses that are merely virtual, that is, that otherwise exist only as the objects of their normative attitudes. But the authority to do that that authority in which their autonomy consists is not itself the product of their own attitudes, nor of the attitudes of other normative subjects who are obliged to respect their autonomy by attributing that authority. Their possession of that authority is for Kant just a fact about them, as is everyone else's responsibility to respect it. By contrast, the recognitive authority of Hegelian normative subjects is instituted entirely by recognitive attitudes that correspond to Kantian respect for one's own autonomy and the autonomy of others. The recognitive status that is virtual as the mere object of recognitive attitudes, attributions of authority, is actualized according to the recognitive model when and only when the recognizing subject is recognized as a recognizing subject by another recognizing subject whom the first subject recognizes in turn. They do not and cannot individually lift themselves up into the normative status of genuinely having recognitive authority by the bootstraps of their own recognitive attitudes, that is, attributions of authority. But the recognitive unit they form when their recognition is mutual does lift the attitudes of both. It does promote their statuses, their recognitive authority, that are merely virtual as the objects of their attitudes up to the level of actual, genuine normative statuses. The recognitive statuses are not immediately instituted by recognitive attitudes, but they are actually instituted by suitably socially complemented reciprocal recognitive attitudes. This, I claim, is the basic constellation of attitudes and statuses that Hegel invokes under the rubric of the process of the pure begriff of recognition, of the duplicating of self-consciousness in its oneness." End of the quote. He introduces the topic by saying, self-consciousness exists in and for itself because and by virtue of its existing in and for itself for another which is to say it exists only as recognized." End of that quote. What a normative subject is in itself is what I'm talking about as normative statuses. In my idiom, what it is for itself is a matter of its normative attitudes. Being a subject of normative statuses and attitudes depends on being recognized as such by another normative subject. Quote, a self-consciousness exists for a self-consciousness. Only so is it in fact self-consciousness." End of that quote. This is the step that sees recognition, the successor attitude to Kantian respect, 
as an essential constitutive element of the status of normative self-conscious selfhood that is the successor status to Kantian autonomy. Furthermore, instituting a self in the sense of something with the status of a normative subject of normative statuses and attitudes requires recognitive attitudes that are symmetric, reciprocal, or mutual. Hegel says, each is for the other the middle term through which each mediates itself with itself and unites with itself. And each is for itself and for the other an immediate being on its own account, which at the same time is such only through this mediation. They recognize themselves as mutually recognizing one another. End of the quote. Here we see the move from the Kantian immediate institution of statuses by individual attitudes to the Hegelian recognitive institution of, ad, of statuses by attitudes that are socially mediated by the attitudes of others. Quote, thus the movement is simply the double movement of the two self-consciousnesses. Each sees the other do the same as it does. Each does itself what it demands of the other and therefore also does what it does only insofar as the other does the same. Action by one side only would be useless because what is to happen can only be brought about by both. End of that quote. It's this symmetric recognitive constellation of basic normative attitudes and statuses that he refers to in the very next sentence as the pure begriff of recognition, of the duplicating of self-consciousness in its oneness. It's the basic structure of robust general recognition in which suitably socially complemented recognitive attitudes institute statuses of recognitive authority, institute their normative subjects, and institute the dyadic community that consists of normative subjects who actually reciprocally recognize and are recognized by each other. Quote, the elaboration of the concept of this spiritual unity within its doubling presents us with the movement of recognition. End of the quote. Recognizing another is taking or treating that other in practice as a normative self, as the subject of normative attitudes and statuses. More specifically, in the model, it's the attitude of attributing the status of having the authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes when those attitudes are suitably socially complemented. This is a version of the sort of authority that is Kantian autonomy, differing in the understanding of the specific constellation of attitudes that can institute, that is actualize otherwise virtual statuses, understanding it as socially mediated rather than individually immediate. Adopting recognitive attitudes in this sense is applying, is applying to the one recognized an articulated normative conception of a self. It's a consciousness of a self as a self. And the recognizing consciousness also has that concept applied to it. It's a recognizing self for a recognizing self. But the self it's a self for, the one that is conscious of it as a self, is not in the first instance itself, but the recognized recognizing other self. The self-consciousness that's instituted and actualized for the recognizing and recognized individuals making up the recognitive dyad is a property they have only as a recognitive dyad. It's only secondarily and as a result that it's a property of each individual. Hegel refers to the recognitive community of recognizing and recognized individual normative subjects as spirit, Geist. Quote, this absolute substance which is the unity of the different independent self-consciousnesses, which in their opposition enjoy perfect freedom and independence, the I that is we and the we that is I. In the model I'm recommending, independence is authority, the authority of the several recognitive subjects. It's not immediate authority, pure independence, but authority that's socially mediated by the attitudes of others who attribute it in recognizing the independent normative subject as authoritative. Freedom is Hegel's term for the symmetric recognitive constellation 
that integrates immediacy as the actuality of attitudes with their social mediation through the requirement of suitable social complementation of attitudes for their institutional authority, that is, their authority to institute genuine normative statuses. The last diagram I showed represents only the most general outlines of the complex constellation of basic normative attitudes and statuses that is the model of Hegelian recognition that I'm proposing as a successor to the model of Kantian autonomy. For it characterizes only the structure of robust general recognition, the recognitive attitudes that institute the recognitive status of having, which requires being recognized as having, recognitive authority. What's left out of that diagram are the specific non-recognitive statuses of responsibility and authority, parad paradigmatically for claimings or judgings and for intentional doings, that Kant took autonomous normative subjects to have the authority to institute by their attitudes of acknowledgement. Focusing on conditions on possession of specific normative statuses, we can start with the one Kantian autonomy emphasizes, responsibility. Hegel doesn't want to relinquish Kant's insight that one is in the first instance responsible only for what one acknowledges responsibility for. He wants to supplement it with the thought that it's nugatory to acknowledge a commitment unless one has licensed someone to hold you responsible. Ultimately, this will be a matter of the conditions of determinate contentfulness of, co of commitment. Unless administered, the commitment is not determinately contentful. The recognition model requires suitable social complementation of attitudes for the statuses that are the objects of those attitudes to be actualized and instituted. It follows that as with the Kantian autonomy structure, attributing responsibility has to be complemented by the acknowledgement of the subject of the responsibility. One only is responsible, a status, for what one acknowledges responsibility for, an attitude. The status of responsibility, which is virtual in the sense of just being the object of these paired attitudes of attribution and acknowledgement, only becomes actualized, a status outside the attitudes it's an object of, when the status attributed is also acknowledged. That's just the other side of the coin of the requirement that for acknowledging a commitment or responsibility to succeed in instituting that status, for it to be constitutive of the commitment it acknowledges, for it to be successful, a successful undertaking of that commitment, a status, someone else must both be authorized to hold the subject responsible, to attribute the commitment and attitude, and must actually do so. Kant does not require this social complementation of attitudes, but thinks that autonomous individual subjects just come with the authority to actualize the statuses that are the objects of their attitudes immediately in the sense of not depending on any other actual attitudes. And according to the social recognitive model, the same paired conditions requiring social complementation of normative attitudes to institute normative statuses holds for attributions and acknowledgments of authority. One only has authority, including the authority to institute statuses by one's attitudes, if others take one to have that authority by attributing it. Absent others treating one as authoritative, one's own claim to authority is incomplete. The authority in question remains merely virtual as the object of the subject's claiming attitude. It's a presupposition of the actualization of determinate statuses that the one who holds the first subject responsible has been authorized to do so, and that that recognizing subject takes it that the first one is authorized to acknowledge the commitment. Acknowledging a status such as responsibility is suitably complemented only if some recognized recognizer also attributes it, holds one responsible. And attributing a status such as responsibility is suitably complemented only if it's also acknowledged by the recognized recognizer to whom it's attributed. Now, I put this diagram up there mostly just to horrify you. Uh, I mean, in fact, <laughs> 
I'm committed to the correctness of extending the model of Hegel's thought to this further level of fine structure. But I'm not going to go into it here. Uh, I'm mostly fessing up to the hermeneutic equivalent of what my teacher David Lewis meant when he characterized one of his own metaphysical views as mad dog modal realism. This is some kind of mad dog hermeneutic modeling of uh, Hegel's thought. The core idea of the recognitive model concerns what's required for statuses of responsibility and authority that are virtual in the sense of being the objects of attitudes of attribution and acknowledgement to be actualized. It's the, you know, this is the question of where norms come from. It's the idea that for such actualization, it's necessary and sufficient for the attitudes in question to be part of an appropriate social constellation of other attitudes. A constellation of attitudes appropriate for realizing their objects is one in which the attitudes of attributing or acknowledging the responsibility and authority are suitably complemented by other attitudes. When the statuses that are attributed to another subject are also acknowledged by that subject, and when the statuses that are acknowledged by one subject are also attributed to that subject, and when the normative subjects of these symmetric attitudes generally recognize each other, then genuine normative statuses are instituted. That's where authority and responsibility come from. That's what they metaphysically consist in. To recognize someone in the general sense is to attribute the authority to adopt attitudes that will, if suitably complemented, institute statuses, that is, actualize the statuses that are the objects of those attitudes. At the center of my story has been an account of Hegel's successor conception to Kant's autonomy version of the attitude dependence of some crucial normative statuses, specifically determinately contentful responsibilities both doxastic and practical. For Kant, endorsements in the form of judgments and commitments to practical maxims. Kant combines his development of the characteristic modern idea of the attitude dependence of normative statuses with an acknowledgement of the traditional idea of the status dependence of normative attitudes. For Kant, the authority that is autonomy and the responsibility that is the duty to respect, the precursor of recognition, are statuses that are not themselves instituted by attitudes. They're postulated as actual authority and responsibility that are not promoted from the virtual status of being objects of attitudes that institute them. Hegel's critique of modernity takes the form of a diagnosis of it as opposing a one-sided hyper-subjectivity to the one-sided hyper-objectivity of traditional conceptions of normativity. That normative statuses are attitude dependent is a genuine insight. That it'll be understood only one-sidedly if it's not balanced by an appreciation of what was right about the traditional appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes, the responsibility that attitudes owe to statuses, the dimension of authority that statuses exercise over attitudes. Kant has one way of combining these insights and Hegel proposes another. Now, the bulk of my discussion has been on the side of pragmatics, the study of normative attitudes and statuses that are the bearers of determinate discursive content. To understand the dimension of status dependence of attitudes though, we have to look at the side of semantics. For the distinction for Hegel between phenomena and noumena, between appearance and reality, between what things are for consciousness and what they are in themselves, shows up both in the form of the pragmatic distinction between attitudes and statuses, and in the form of the semantic distinction between senses and reference, as I would render that Phrygian distinction in Hegel's terms. In pragmatic terms, it takes the form of the distinction between what consciousness is for a consciousness, itself or another, and what a consciousness is in itself. 
This is the distinction between what a normative subject is really committed or entitled to, its actual responsibilities and authority, and what responsibilities or authority other subjects attribute to it or it acknowledges or claims itself. That's just the distinction between statuses and attitudes. Semantically, though, appearances, what things are for consciousness, are the Hegelian analog of Phrygian senses. What those senses refer to or represent, how things are in themselves, is the reality that is the Hegelian analog of Phrygian reference. Hegel accepts Kant's insight that what a representing, here a sense, an appearance, what things are for consciousness, that what a representing represents is to be understood in normative terms as what exercises a distinctive kind of authority over the correctness of the representing. That's what the representing is responsible to for its correctness, what provides the normative standard for assessments of its correctness. This is the semantic correlate of the status dependence of normative attitudes. The sense in which what, the conscious, what consciousness is for consciousness, a subject's normative attitudes, is responsible to, dependent on, what consciousness is in itself, what it's really committed to or authoritative about, which accordingly exercises an authority over those attitudes. The relation between phenomena as representings, Hegelian senses, and noumena as representeds, Hegelian reference, is established, Hegel tells us, by the process of recollection, erinnerung. That's a retrospective, rational reconstruction of an expressively progressive process of experience as explicitation. The gradual emergence for consciousness of how things are in themselves. There's a deep connection between this account of the process by which content is determined, viewed prospectively, becoming more determinate, viewed retrospectively, as explicitly revealing new aspects of the always already determinate content that has been all along implicit, and the relation between normative attitudes and normative statuses, according to the recognitive model of the institution of statuses by attitudes. To begin with, the context of those content determining processes on the side of semantics is provided by the recognitive processes that institute normative statuses on the side of pragmatics. As we, the readers of the phenomenology, see in the discussion of the consciousness chapters and consider further in the discussion of the reason chapter, content determination is the incorporation of immediacy in the mediated form of conceptual content. It's the process of giving contingency the form of necessity. Specifically, that immediacy takes the form of normative attitudes that subjects actually adopt in the course of experience in response to collisions among attitudes they find themselves with, both through perception and through inference. Those collisions of attitudes, finding oneself with incompatible commitments, are the experience of error that he talks about in the introduction. Acknowledging some commitments normatively requires sacrificing others incompatible with them, determ that determinately negate them. That phase of the experience of error in turn requires retrospective revisions of one's understanding of the conceptual contents of one's commitments, of what is really incompatible with what and what really follows from what. This final retrospective, rationally reconstructive phase of each cycle of the experience of error enforces to consciousness the distinction between noumena and phenomena, between how things really are and how things merely seem or appear. The form that distinction takes on the side of the subject is the distinction between normative statuses, what one has really committed oneself to in claiming, for instance, that the coin is copper, and the normative attitudes, for instance, what one takes oneself to be committed to in making such a claim. This pragmatic distinction reflects the distinction between the conceptual contents that are Hegelian reference and those that are Hegelian senses, the appearances of those reference what they are for consciousness. Thought of from the point of view of the subject, 
the process of content determination by which noumena, reference, represented, becomes something to consciousness distinct from the phenomena, the senses, the representings, that the experience of error unmasks as what things are for consciousness, is the emergence of the distinction between what is right with respect to the relations of material incompatibility and consequence, that is determinate negation and mediation that articulate conceptual contents, and what merely seems right to the subject whose contentful commitments are at issue. And this is just another reflection of the distinction between normative statuses and attitudes. As Wittgenstein puts the point, one would like to say, whatever is going to seem right to me is right. And that only means that here we can't talk about right. Pragmatically, the question of how to understand noumena in terms of phenomena, which I've been addressing semantically, shows up precisely as the question of how it is that attitudes, how things seem to the subject, can institute genuine statuses, which are binding on and beyond the attitudes of the subject. How can mere attitudes be transcended? Here we've seen that the key insight motivating the recognitive model is that we can make sense of the distinction between status and attitudes only if in acknowledging a responsibility, committing oneself, one is at the same time authorizing others to hold one responsible by attributing that responsibility or commitment. They can then be understood as administering a content that one has committed oneself to, a content that is not determined just by the attitudes of the acknowledger, the one who has the commitment. To see acknowledging a responsibility and attributing authority to hold one responsible as two sides of one coin, both articulates the distinction between mere attitudes and genuine statuses and brings into play the notion of determinate content as what one makes oneself responsible for. This is what the requirement that attitudes be suitably complemented in order to institute genuine statuses does. It makes available determinate contents and thereby articulates the dimension along which attitudes are dependent on statuses in the sense of being responsible to them for assessments of their correctness senses as answering for their correctness to reference. The status dependence of attitude shows up in the recognitive model as a sense in which pragmatics, the theory of normative force, is constrained by semantics, the theory of conceptual content. Statuses are normative phenomena, what consciousness is in itself, and attitudes are normative phenomena, what consciousness is for itself or for others. The story about noumena and phenomena in terms of recollection is accordingly the form of the story about the status dependence of attitudes. Kant, having top-level general statuses, had this aspect of status dependence of attitudes, as well as attitude dependence of statuses, since both autonomy and the duty of respect are statuses. But what autonomy is the authority to do is to institute statuses by attitudes, which is a form of the attitude dependence of the resulting specific statuses. So Kant divided the labor, status dependence of general attitudes, including the precursor of recognition, autonomy, and the attitude dependence of specific statuses. The statuses and their contents are determined in the end by what's represented. The attitudes can be thought of as senses, which inherit this crucial dimension of content from their reference. The content determines what one is really responsible for, the status to which the attitudes answer for their correctness, even though they instituted the status. That responsibility is administered by those one has made oneself responsible to in endorsing or acknowledging a responsibility. Those to whom one has thereby ceded the authority to determine what one is really responsible for. If there's, no determinate, if there's no responsibility to others, then in exercising one's authority to commit oneself, one cannot succeed in making oneself responsible for any determinate content. That's the cost of not having responsibility to others, not acknowledging the authority of others correlative with one's own authority to undertake responsibility. In claiming that the coin is copper, the commitment I undertake the responsibility I acknowledge is not determined just by my attitudes, 
I've made myself responsible to the actual content of the concept copper that I've applied. I've authorized others to hold me responsible, not just according to my conception of copper, what I take to follow from or be incompatible with such a commitment, a matter of my attitudes, but according to the real content of the counter I've played in the public language game. That's what determines what I've really committed myself to, the status I've actually acquired by my performance. The essentially social relations between normative attitudes and normative statuses both the institution of statuses by attitudes and the dependence of attitudes on statuses, their responsibility to statuses for their correctness on the pragmatic side of force, and the essentially historical relations between what the contents are for consciousness, phenomena, senses representing, and what they are in themselves, noumena, reference, the represented, on the semantic side of conceptual content, are two sides of one coin, recognitive and experiential aspects of one sort of developmental process. Here's a rough diagram of that uh, idea. And this is a picture of the bigger story of which the one I've been telling is uh, an aspect. The retrospective, rational, reconstructive, historical phase of the process of experience, Hegel's Erinnerung, explains how on the semantic side, objective conceptual contents, reference, noumena, what things are in themselves, articulated as laws, facts, and objects with properties, both are to be understood in terms of and serve as standards for assessment of the correctness of the process of manipulating subjective conceptual contents senses by applying rules, propositions, and singular terms and predicates in adopting doxastic attitudes. The social character of the recognitive process that institutes both normative subjects and their communities explains on the pragmatic side both how normative statuses, noumena, what self-conscious subjects are in themselves, are instituted by, and in that sense strongly dependent on, responsible to normative attitudes, that is, phenomena, what self-conscious subjects are for themselves, and how those statuses have authority over those attitudes, serving as standards for assessment of their correctness. This is the dimension of the status dependence of normative attitudes, the responsibility of those attitudes to statuses that balances the attitude dependence of normative statuses. Well, the recognitive model then is Hegel's way of synthesizing two crucial insights. First, what he sees as the founding insight of modernity, the idea that normative statuses are attitude dependent, has boiled down and purified in the Kant Rousseau idea of autonomy into the idea that at least some normative statuses are instituted by normative attitudes. The second is what was right about the traditional idea, one sidedly overemphasized by pre-modern thought of the status dependence of normative attitudes. The idea that our attributions and acknowledgments of responsibility and authority answer for their correctness to facts about what people really are committed and entitled to, what authority and responsibility they really have. The complex social historical recognitive model of normativity is Hegel's way of performing the Eiertanz required to make simultaneous sense both of the institution of normative statuses by normative attitudes and the role of normative statuses as standards for assessments of the correctness of normative attitudes. At its base is the idea that to undertake a responsibility must always be also to acknowledge the authority of others to hold one responsible, implicitly to attribute that authority and explicitly to attribute determinate contentful authority to someone is also always to attribute implicit responsibilities defined by that content, administered on its behalf by others to whom one has made oneself responsible by the original assertion of the authority to make oneself responsible. In the case of the attribution of authority that is general recognition, that includes acknowledging one's own responsibility to respect exercises of that very authority. In Hegel's terms, there is no independence, 
without a correlative dependence, authority and responsibility are two sides of one coin. And consciousness is accordingly essentially self-consciousness in the sense that one cannot make sense of what consciousness is in itself apart from concern with what it is for itself. And further, it's of the essence of the recognitive model of self-conscious normative subjects that what consciousness is in and for itself is always a matter of the constellation of attitudes comprising what a self-consciousness, an individual normative subject, is both for itself and for others in the recognitive community that is necessarily simultaneously, simultaneously synthesized by reciprocal recognitive attitudes, along with the individual recognized and recognizing self-consciousnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, for that um, very rich and multi-layered presentation of, of Hegel's argument. Um, I'm aware that time's running short, but I, I just want to give everyone two minutes um, to take a, a quick breather, regather your thoughts, and we'll be back for questions. Um, at about 17 past the hour. And the attributing, as you've set it out, are jointly sufficient for the institution of normative status. And um, I want to approach it through a concern from what may seem to be a surprising place, uh, namely Nietzsche, uh, not the sort of reductive uh, normativity denying caricature of Nietzsche, but the Nietzsche in the second essay of the genealogy, where he's interested in the emergence of autonomy and responsibility um, in human history, and interested in what it is for beings to have a right to make promises, take responsibility for their actions, and, and, and this sort of thing. Um, now, he doesn't have any sort of reciprocal recognitive element, and I think that that weakens the account. But one thing that is there that I think is philosophically interesting and important is the idea that a kind of capability behind your commitments is very significant. So your commitments are idle unless you have the capacity to follow through on them or to, you know, to carry them out. And he contrasts the people who are uh, genuine bearers of responsibility with those who are feeble windbags who are not able to, um, to uh, carry out uh, what they promise. So what I'm wondering is, do you think this capability component is important? And do you think that it is captured in what you're describing as the status dependence of normative attitudes? Okay, good. Uh, no, I don't think it's captured uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, the analysis I'm uh, seeing uh, following out from these, uh, this reading of uh, Hegel's text is just on the normative side and is not looking to uh, practical abilities. Uh, it's ability only in the normative sense of having the authority to do it. Uh, now, uh, Hegel does think that the way determinate content gets into uh, our commitments is through the actual attitudes that uh, practitioners adopt. And it presumably is the case that uh, if one is systematically unable to follow through on one's commitments to on the side of uh, uh, judgment, uh, endorse commitments that uh, are consequences of the commitment one has undertaken and reject commitments that are incompatible with it. Uh, if one shows oneself systematically incapable of uh, fulfilling one's commitments, that uh, people will stop holding you responsible. Uh, as with the, the boy who cried uh, wolf. Uh, but I don't see Hegel anyway in the phenomenology as uh, making anything of that uh, particular possibility. So I would see Nietzsche as adding uh, what, as you indicate, does seem to be an important uh, aspect uh, to that story that I don't, that I see Hegel as having room for, but not as uh, exploiting. Great, thank, thank you. Uh, Philip, you're next. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Brandon, for a very fascinating talk. So I wondered, um, so you seem to rely a lot on the quote in 184, where Hegel speaks about uh, they recognize themselves as mutually recognizing each other. But then in the very next um, paragraph, as you said, this is, Hegel says, this is the pure concept of recognition, but uh, we need to see how the development uh, continues as it appears for self-consciousness. And so by, by Hegel's own um, um, thought, there seems to be like something lacking in that pure concept of recognition that that needs to be supplemented by appearances, um, which I take to be, you know, the sensuous world, um, the world in which self-consciousness is initially immersed as desire. So I was wondering if you could say something more about how you read the element of appearance here and how that factors into your account of recognition. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I mean, the way I'm reading this section uh, of the text, we're in the introduction to um, uh, the discussion in uh, self-consciousness uh, and uh, this account of uh, genuine normative statuses as instituted by reciprocal recognition, that's the lesson we're eventually going to learn. That's the picture we're going to get of uh, undistorted uh, normative uh, structures. Uh, but for us to actually learn that lesson, the one that he's signposting, the one he's pointing forward uh, to, for us to learn that, we've got to start with the one-sided uh, deformed conceptions that are the way uh, the social character of normative statuses first appear to us, uh, namely uh, in the uh, normative communities with the structure, with the asymmetric recognitive structure, the deformed recognitive structure of uh, subordination and obedience that he's allegorizing with the master and uh, the slave. Uh, so I see him, uh, the talk about appearances, uh, this is uh, the appearance very darkly in a glass of uh, the constitutive ideal of genuine uh, normativity as uh, instituted by reciprocal recognition, that's not how it shows up uh, first. And we're gonna have to follow out uh, the development of those appearances, rehearse that uh, as we, the readers of the book, look over the shoulder of uh, those phenomenal forms of self-consciousness, uh, that's going to be the way we win our way through to an understanding of uh, this pure conception of uh, recognition that he claims is implicit all along, but um, it needs to be made explicit by uh, a phenomenology, by our retrospectively, rationally reconstructing and rehearsing uh, the emergence into explicitness of this uh, uh, initially implicit conception. Okay, thank you. Can I, do I have time for a quick follow-up? If it's very direct, go for it. This implicit component, would you class that as ethical substance? Uh, yes, uh, it's going to be the, uh, not immediate Zittlichkeit, but the uh, mediated form that comes when we've synthesized uh, what was right about traditional pre-modern forms of life with the distinctively modern uh, form uh, and overcome, but by synthesizing, overcoming the alienation that's characteristic of the modern uh, form of life and that keeps us from that uh, Zidlichkeit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, that's very helpful. Tom, you're up next. Am I okay? Thanks very much, Andrew, for hosting it. And thanks so, so much, Bob. I really enjoyed the paper um, and absolutely tons to think about. Um, I think that what I have really is a, it's a question of clarification about the interesting notion of taking oneself to be responsible um, and perhaps the relationship between that notion and perhaps, 
um, the kind of social institution of normative status. Um, and in particular, it was a question about how to understand the idea of taking oneself to be responsible in a way that's fit to play the role um, of figuring in that very strong claim that being responsible is constituted by taking oneself to be responsible, perhaps in conjunction with um, other people finding one responsible. So, I mean, as you were talking, I had in mind a kind of um, a situation, a kind of parody extension uh, of of maybe myself and my family relations, right? So imagine a narcissistic layabout who's only interested in doing philosophy. He has two children who he never really sees. Um, he pays them no money in the support. Um, and despite the frequent entreaties of the mother of these children, um, does not provide any money for their upkeep and provides them with no emotional sustenance or what have you. The kind of person who might be taken to court and, you know, fined and what have you. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I have a sort of te temptation to want to think that a guy like that is responsible. Um, you know, he has the normative status of being responsible for these people to whom he's related by the bonds of family. But nevertheless, at least without kind of telling me a bit of a story about what taking oneself to be responsible is, I want to think, well, look, he, I mean, the whole point of this is that he doesn't take himself to be responsible. Um, I don't maybe take myself to be responsible. Or I suppose in another kind of case, just sort of flipping it around, one might think about the relations one bears to one's parents as well. Um, so this, I, I mean, I owe my aging parents as they become more infirm, kind of various responsibilities towards care towards them. I, it seems kind of odd to me to think that those responsibilities are underpinned by my explicit recognition of my responsibilities towards them. I mean, I'm kind of, it, it kind of, I have no choice in the matter, Bob. I was, I was born, here I am. I'm kind of constrained um, to find myself chained to them by these ties of commitment in the first place, I guess. And the phenomenology as I try and shrug these things off by refusing to take rational responsibility is, I never will. <laughs> I never will. Um, so I wonder, it's really, uh, it, it's a question of clarification, really. It's about wanting to kind of know what you want to say about these cases. Do you want to say that, is it perhaps that I, I am responsible, but it kind of implicitly somehow? Or is it that you want the social institutions to take up the slack of family well, relations? I mean, what, what do you think? Well, well good. Uh, looking, looking at the first case, uh, your layabout did commit himself. Uh, he did acknowledge the commitment. He exercised uh, Kantian autonomy, the authority to make yourself responsible, to commit yourself, to bind yourself by a norm. Uh, paradigmatically, uh, in the wedding, uh, the, that ceremony is uh, a standing up and inviting people to hold you to the commitment that you are undertaking there, uh, to hold you responsible. That's the role of that community in standing before them. You are recognizing them. You are granting them the authority to hold you responsible. Uh, same thing I would say is true of the baptism of, uh, of a child. This is why this is uh, uh, also a communal uh, a communal event. Uh, and then you can, in, in your own attitude, be as irresponsible as you like without, in terms of your practical acknowledgement of that responsibility, without undercutting the fact of your commitment, of your responsibility, of what you undertook by uh, performing that uh, speech act. Um, more than a speech act, that uh, discursive uh, act. In the case of the parents, uh, it is more difficult. Uh, one wants to know, well, what would Kant say uh, uh, about that? Uh, presumably he would find uh, a commitment to uh, uh, tr treating them with respect as implicit in uh, things one had explicitly 
uh, acknowledged. Uh, but Hegel has uh, uh, an interesting and uh, in the end, I think deep story about uh, the family as uh, the initial natural recognitive unit with uh, both of the Confucian dimensions, the, the filial and the uh, fraternal as ones we find ourselves with as members of the family. Uh, he sees that as pre-modern, uh, as a sensuous prefiguring of uh, fully voluntary uh, associations, but that has uh, in fact the, the recognitive structure needed to institute genuine uh, responsibilities, both vertically and uh, horizontally. Thank you ever so much. Stephen Holgate, you're next. Yes, thank you very much, Bob. Um, I first of all want to say that I thoroughly agree, obviously, as you'll expect, uh, uh, with you about the importance of mutual recognition for Hegel. And just let me add as well, I think the emphasis you place on trust, uh, it seems to me uh, exactly right. Um, what I want to ask about is the the pair of authority and responsibility because i wonder how exhaustive you want that to be or you think hegel takes that to be um, in our understanding of uh, relations between uh, normative selves and what prompts me to ask this question is hegel's account of love in the philosophy of right now, I realize this is not fair in one sense because I'm going outside the phenomenology to the philosophy of right. Uh, but this is the problem I've got. I'm wondering about the extent to which one can think of being in love, loving another, as a matter of exercising authority over that other. That seems odd to me. I also wonder, actually, and you might find this surprising, about the extent to which being in love involves an explicit sense of and taking oneself to be responsible. Putting it simply, responsibility, as I understand it, seems very much a kind of moralish uh, uh, status, whereas love obviously is ethical. Um, now, clearly, one has responsibilities to the one one loves, but, but it's hard to understand the being in love as um, involving a sense of responsibility. I'm thinking a little bit about the, the, the stuff that Bob Stern has worked on uh, in this respect. Um, and similarly, I find it a little strange to think of being in love as a status that might be administered by another. Now, in one sense, one can imagine, clearly, someone says, I love you, and others might look on and say, well, I'm afraid you don't, because X, Y, and Z. So, yes, I can imagine that story. But, but I don't think of that as being in love. So I suppose I wonder if you could just say something about the whether the terms authority and, and responsibility are flexible enough to encompass that case, um, or whether you would want to tell a different story about that. And maybe there are other examples that also uh, require a slightly different vocabulary. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, there's... Uh definitely a cost to using terms like authority and responsibility and commitment and entitlement. Uh, I mean, those are my, my uh, favored uh, readings of independence and dependence uh, uh, when we're talking about subjects uh, on the side of the subjects in Hegel uh, to try and get the same kind of flexibility that the notion of independence and dependence uh, has for him and the range of it. And of course, authority and responsibility and uh, entitlement and commitment are not exactly the same thing either. And so I'm trying to get some of the, uh, that additional flexibility by uh, mixing and matching uh, uh, between those. But uh, I'm aiming to reconstruct uh, the fundamental norm inducing uh, recognition of someone as a normative subject, as uh, having authority, having responsibility, able to commit themselves, having entitlements, and as 
acknowledging those things and as attributing them. Oh, uh, that's a model for love, but it's not what love consists in. Uh, there's mm -hmm. both more and less to uh, love than that. Uh, and I don't have uh, a detailed story about um, love as the ultimately natural family-based uh, but uh, sensuous image and incarnation of uh, this basic uh, geistic uh, uh, relation. And I do think one would need to, to say uh, uh, more about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the young Hegel in the, in the Stift uh, responding in the first excitement as uh, the three of them read religion within the bounds of reason alone. Uh, so, well, this Morales uh, uh, take uh, said, uh, Kant's entirely right, uh, but fantasy, herz, and sinnlichkeit must not be sent empty away. Mm -hmm. And I think throughout his uh, writing, throughout his work, uh, he aimed not to send them empty away. And in his account of love in particular, those are important. Uh, and I don't have uh, mm -hmm. an account of those passages, just how this model uh, applies. But that love is a, a, a sensuous representation and, and um, embodiment of uh, this basic normative structure. Uh, that I think uh, he's committed to, I'm committed to there being uh, a way of making, uh, making sense of that. Mm -hmm. I guess just briefly in response, I, what I had in mind by love in a sense wasn't so much the natural dimension, but a particular form of ethical, um, spiritual life that in a sense is, is no longer specifically understandable in terms of a relation of independence and dependence. I, I guess that's what I had in mind. I'm, I'm thinking, he says, you know, it, it's, I know myself as the unity of myself with another and of the other with me. It's this, it's this deep unity that seems to somehow not, it's still ethical, I think, but it, but but to be more, as you say, more than the the, the relationship between individuals. So anyway, well, okay, well, uh, that's what I had in mind. I, I take the point that the, the particularly in uh, discussing actual institutions, Hegel is deploying a richer uh, array of normative meta concepts than I'm reconstructing here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew Chitty. Uh, thank you. Really interesting paper. Uh, I've got a question which um, is uh, perhaps a bit simplistic, but um, at least uh, your response, I hope, will clarify uh, what you're saying. As I see it, uh, what you're saying is that for Kant, uh, basic normative status, the capacity to create specific normative statuses through one's normative attitudes, uh, is simply given as a rational being. But then it seems that someone with this status can give themselves any specific normative status. So that um, in that Wittgensteinian phrase, whatever seems right to us would be right. So there's no constraint on what kinds of specific normative statuses could uh, be created. So then in your view, Hegel's solution is that this basic normative status is not something just given to us, but is instituted through two subjects, each attributing it to the other. So I've got two questions really. One is um, this kind of reciprocal attribution of basic normative status seems as if it could collapse into a vicious circle as well as sustain itself as a, as, as a virtuous one. Um, it, it seems a bit like a hall of mirrors in which the basic normative status of each is dependent on that of the other, which is dependent on that of the first and so on and so on. Um, and the second question is, doesn't the same criticism um, that you raised against the Kantian picture also apply to this picture? 
namely a pair of subjects who give each other basic normative status could then um, create any specific normative statuses at all, at least as long as they're not incompatible with respecting uh, each other as having basic normative status. So again, it looks as if with that qualification, whatever seems right to us would be right. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, this is invoking pieces of the story that are uh, largely off stage from uh, uh, the bit of it I told today, though, though th this is precisely what I was uh, gesturing at in uh, the final bit of uh, the presentation. So Kant has the idea that uh, subjects have available uh, completely determinate, uh, a stable of completely determinate uh, ground level empirical and practical concepts uh, that they can pull off the shelf and bind themselves by uh, that are what make the uh, commitments that they undertake cognitively and practically determinate is because I've pulled the uh, pulled off the shelf uh, the concept dog and uh, applied that uh, to something. And now the content of that rule is what I've bound myself by. Uh, now, it's a good question where those come from. And I think Hegel thought that Kant was uncharacteristically but culpably uh, uncritical about the source of those determinate uh, concepts as rules one binds oneself by. Uh, I've been talking about the pragmatic notion of what's required for you really to bind yourself by them. But Hegel's equally interested in the question of uh, the determinateness of uh, the rule that you bind yourself uh, by. Uh, and it's a criteria, I think he takes as an explicit criterion of adequacy of the recognitive picture that it makes sense of both of those, both of the sense of binding on the pragmatic side uh, and of the content, the determinateness of the content on the semantic side. Now, what I was mostly talking about today is, uh, well, how could you count as bound? Well, why isn't, uh, if uh, you're being committed is entirely up to you, you acknowledging the commitment, uh, then why doesn't anything, you know, in, in what sense, what, what are you bound by? And there, the answer I think is intelligible. Well, you've authorized somebody else to hold you responsible. Uh, and they're administering uh, this commitment uh, on behalf of it, its content. Uh, so that you can count as genuinely having bound yourself uh, in a way that goes beyond what you take yourself to have in your attitudes, your conception of what you've bound yourself by. So I called the coin copper, uh, and that means I committed myself to the coin melting at 1,084 degrees C, whether I know that or not. But I've authorized uh, the metallurgist to hold me responsible for that uh, in virtue of having played this counter in the public, uh, uh, in the public game. Now the story about how uh, determinate conceptual contents that bind all of us and transcend all of our attitudes can emerge from our actual applications of uh, concepts that's the story that requires the historical dimension, uh, the recollective uh, dimension, uh, not just the social one uh, that I was talking about here. And all I did was wave my hands in that, uh, uh, in the direction of that story. I wasn't really trying to, to tell it here, uh, but that's what I take to be sort of the chief glory of the phenomenology is that I think he has uh, a, a worked out, workable answer to that uh, question. How, uh, well, it's unintelligible that I should on my own uh, manage to deploy conceptual contents that are determinate in the sense that they set standards for their correct application that transcend the attitudes of me who committed myself to them, 
Uh, he has an account of how we all can do that in virtue of uh, the historical character um, that uh, of our recognitive communities that we see when we interpret the mistakes that we and our forebears made and tell uh, expressively progressive uh, retrospective stories about uh, the development, the emergence uh, from Im implicitness into greater, ever greater explicitness of the contents that we've been uh, applying uh, to make sense of the notion of these transcendent things. So uh, uh, I think Hegel saw that possibility in uh, 1806 uh, uh, and uh, gave us a full-blown theory of it. But I didn't tell that part of the story today. Thank you. Um, we're practically out of time, but Hemdatz has brought to my attention that, Naomi, did you have a question? Um, did you raise your hand, your physical hand, and I missed it? Would you like to finish us off with the last question? I think you're still on mute. I think people have to go. I might write it to Bob if I may. Okay. Um, well, uh, it's been an immensely rich session. Um, Naomi might follow up a question with you, Bob. Um, but on behalf of the department at Warwick, um, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've given us a lot to think about um, and uh, we look forward to following your work and, um, and engaging with it more. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. There is no audience I would rather present this material to. So I appreciate the invitation and thank you all. Can you unmute us so we can clap properly? Oh Thanks. yes, how do I do that? Unmute, <laughs> I can only mute everybody. Um, we can all everyone, unmute, un unmute yourself and clap. Well, very fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you.